Imagine fuel without fear. No climate change. No oil spills, dead coal miners, dirty air, devastated land, lost wildlife. No energy poverty, no oil-fed wars, tyrannies, terrorists. No leaking nuclear wastes or spreading nuclear weapons. Nothing to run out, nothing to cut off, nothing to worry about. Just energy abundance, benign and affordable for all, forever. Thank you and good morning. At Rocky Mountain Institute, we do solutions, not problems. We're practitioners, not theorists. We do transformation, not incrementalism. So as Peter just mentioned, in less than a year, my team will finish and publish Reinventing Fire, a detailed roadmap for shifting the US completely from oil and coal to efficient use and renewable energy by 2050, led by business for profit. Now most analysts say that big energy shifts need just technology and policy, both narrowly construed. But that misses two even bigger plays, integrative design and business innovation, that is new business models and competitive strategies. I'll sketch this morning how combining and enlarging all four of these plays can create extraordinary business opportunities as energy melds with IT and IP, making controls, communication, customer feedback, the gathering and processing of information more important than machinery. And I'm gonna focus on three big disruptive ideas. First, the recent shift of peak oil from supply to demand, with many tipping points already quietly passed. Integrative design techniques yielding expanding returns to energy efficiency, and how efficiency plus the micropower revolution will profitably eliminate old coal plants and has already made new central power plants obsolete. There are two big narratives here, uh, oil and electricity, which is half about coal. Oil and power plants each release more than two-fifths of U.S. fossil carbon. Let's start with the oil story. <coughs> Six years ago, my team published a detailed, transparent, Pentagon co-sponsored study winning the oil endgame, showing how to eliminate U.S. oil use by the 2040s. Written for business and military leaders, our study was built around novel competitive strategy cases for five sectors. And the solution looks like this, where the upper red curve is U.S. oil use and the dashed lower red curve is oil imports. Uh, so first, we would save half the oil by efficient use at an average cost of $12 a barrel. And then we would substitute saved natural gas and advanced biofuels for the other half at an average cost of $18 a barrel. Uh, the average cost was thus only $15 a barrel, fivefold cheaper than buying oil today, assuming that all of the hidden or external costs of, of buying and burning the oil are worth zero, a conservatively low estimate. Uh, our costliest barrel of savings or substitutions would be $26 oil. And the business case is so compelling, therefore, that implementation would need no new federal taxes, subsidies, mandates, or laws. Now, 70% of U.S. oil is used in vehicles, but their efficiency can triple without compromise, but with better safety, by making them very lightweight, more slippery in moving through the air and along the road and giving them advanced propulsion. This often improves their performance too, for example, with this Opel diesel hybrid concept car, which does 150 miles an hour and 94 miles a gallon, although not at the same instant. Uh, <laughs> uh, triple efficiency cars can repay any extra cost in about a year, triple efficiency trucks even faster, triple efficiency planes in a few years. Uh, <clears throat> now, such breakthrough vehicles can serve all purposes and tastes, for example, so, uh, ten years ago, my team and two European industry partners designed this uncompromised, safe, high-performance, mid-size suburban assault vehicle. Uh, it uses 72% less fuel than its steel equivalent and would sell for $2,500 higher sticker price, a one-year payback, because it's a hybrid electric, but its 53% lighter weight is free, as I'll explain in a moment. 
Three years ago, Toyota showed a carbon fiber concept car uh, with the same interior size as a Prius, but one half its fuel use and one third its weight. Its tiny battery bank is recharged by a, a half liter engine tucked under the rear seat. Uh, and in April uh, 9, RMI's fifth spinoff, which two days ago announced a strategic partnership with General Motors, uh, showed this three to 12 times more fuel efficient aluminum van. But other, uh, unlike other plug-in hybrids, this one needs no subsidy to attract fleet buyers because its lightweight and low drag eliminate most of its costly batteries. Such platform fitness, taking the obesity out of the car, a ton of it in this case, is the key to electrification, which also creates huge opportunities in the electric sector. Now, ultralighting is the most important automotive game changer for three reasons. Only 0.3% of a typical car's fuel energy actually moves the driver. Over two thirds of the energy needed to move the car is caused by its weight, and every unit of energy you save at the wheels saves eight units of fuel at the tank, huge leverage. But ultralight, ultra-safe cars needn't cost more to build, here's why. That SUV you saw a minute ago has only 14 parts, each made uh, in, the, in the body, each made with one low pressure die set saving about 99% of, say, a half billion dollar tooling cost. Each part can be lifted with one hand and no hoist. The parts then snap precisely together for bonding without needing the robotic body shop. Laying color in the mold can also eliminate the paint shop. There go the two hardest and costliest parts of automaking. And then the propulsion system is also two-thirds smaller, hence lighter and cheaper. All these savings pay for the carbon fiber, making the ultralighting free. New manufacturing from RMI's third spin-off, or its Japanese competitors, can make carbon fiber parts like this test piece, tougher than titanium, in just one minute, scaling to automotive cost and speed with aerospace performance. Also makes a good carbon cap. Uh, <laughs> making, I'll, I'll pass this around, don't worry about dropping it. It's. Uh, been whacked with a sledgehammer without even marking it. Uh, now, if you make all US light vehicles this way, that saves oil equivalent to finding a Saudi Arabia under Detroit because ultralighting saves half the weight and half the fuel. The car gets safer because this stuff absorbs 12 times as much crash energy per pound as steel, and the car costs the same to make. My team accelerates such breakthrough oil savings by institutional acupuncture. That is, we figure out where the business logic is congested, not flowing properly, and stick little needles in it to get it flowing. Our partners range from Ford to Walmart, Boeing to the Pentagon, a bunch more. Of course, taking the world beyond oil requires six sectors to be transformed. Cars, trucks, planes, fuels, military, and finance. And I think three or four of those, at least, are already around or past the tipping point where it starts getting easier even though there's still a lot of hard work to do. For example, Boeing converted its 787 Dreamliner leapfrog efficiency into a breakthrough competitive strategy uh, <coughs> by rolling out those innovations to every airplane it makes before uh, Airbus could steer itself out of the ditch. And six years ago, we suggested Detroit follow suit. Two years later, Ford hired the head of Boeing Commercial Airplanes as its own CEO, and now Ford is a sales and innovation winner. Last year, mainstream analysts even began to see peak oil not in supply, but in demand. Uh, April 09, ExxonMobil agreed with many forecasters that U.S. gasoline use had peaked in 07 and will only go down. September 09, Dan Jurgen said OECD oil use had peaked in 05 and will only go down. And October 09, Deutsche Bank forecast world oil use will peak at about 2016, and by 2030 will fall to about 8% below the uh, level today. And they assume China's going to electrify new cars only a third as fast as China's actually planning to do. In other words, oil is becoming uncompetitive even at low prices before it becomes unavailable even at high prices. Intensifying this shift away from oil is a parallel revolution in how road vehicles are used. If this daily traffic congestion graph were an electricity load shape, we'd apply many new IT-enabled demand response and smart grid techniques to flatten it out. And not yet doing this for road traffic is wasting trillions of dollars 
net present value through idle people, idle vehicles, and idle roads. But now we can charge variableized real-time driving costs per mile, not per gallon, make traffic free flowing, use smart IT to enhance transit and empower car and ride sharing, and compete physical mobility against virtual mobility and negatrips created by smarter land use and real estate models like new urbanist design uh, so people are already where they want to be and need not go somewhere else. Those business opportunities are immense. Even more disruptive will be solutions economy business models like Zipcar that lease a mobility or access service rather than selling cars and gallons. This IT-rich transformation can boost cars 4% asset utilization by perhaps an order of magnitude. My second big story is about saving electricity and then making it differently. These twin revolutions promise more numerous, diverse, and profound disruptions in electricity than in any other sector, a future most utilities are ill-equipped to foresee and forestall. 21st century technology and speed are colliding with 20th and 19th century institutions and culture to create a, an inflection point where huge sums will be made or lost. About 70% of US electricity is used by buildings, 30% by industry. Roughly three quarters of our electricity is wasted, according to my team's thousand technology efficiency assessment two decades ago. And since then, efficiency technologies have improved faster than they've been applied. So the potential savings are now even bigger and cheaper. But an even more disruptive innovation we've been hatching is integrative design which turns diminishing returns into expanding returns to investments in energy efficiency. That is, integrative design can make very large energy savings cost less than small or no savings. For example, here's our house in Old Snowmass near Aspen, Colorado. Judy and I live there at 7,100 feet elevation where temperatures have dropped as low as minus 47F. A continuous midwinter cloud can last 39 days and frost can occur any day of the year. But this house is fossil fuel free, a net energy exporter, and 99% passive solar heated with no conventional heating or cooling equipment, making it $1,100 cheaper to build. Inside is this emerging tropical jungle, now ripening our 35th banana crop. In 1984, this house was saving about 99% of its space and water heating energy and 90% of its electricity with a 10 month payback. Today's technologies, which we've just retrofitted, are even better. And the key is integrative design that gives multiple benefits from single expenditures. For example, the white arch you can see in the upper left uh, has 12 functions, but only one cost. Hardly any component has fewer than three functions. Yet the house needn't look like this to work like this, and its design approach works in any climate, including eliminating air conditioning up to at least 115 Fahrenheit with lower construction costs and better comfort.